Welcome back to another episode of Care Transitions Today, a healthcare podcast that focuses on case management and transitions of care. This podcast is presented by the American Case Management Association, ACMA, and is underwritten by the Pfizer Foundation. I'm your host, Deb McElroy, and in this episode, we are going to be discussing uh, lessons from New York uh, for COVID-19. Today's guests uh, include Dr. Julie Merkin and Dr. Robert Grant, and we're going to begin today by welcoming Dr. Julie Merkin. Uh, Julie is uh, the Senior Vice President and Chief Nursing Officer at Brookdale University Hospital and Medical Center in New York. Uh, She leads nursing operations there. Um, She is well known to ACMA. She serves as the President for the New York chapter. Um, She has received several leadership awards in her very storied career and has uh, presented regionally and nationally across the country. Julie, I am going to turn it over to you and uh, sort of fill our audience in on uh, who you are and your experience. Thanks, Deb. So hello, everyone. It's my pleasure and privilege to be part of this podcast to share with you some lessons learned from New York. Um, I have been a chief nurse executive for almost 20 years in my career, but my true love has always been care coordination and case management. And so I have been working in that field for about 25 years. So in every role that I've ever had in an organization, I've always been responsible for both nursing and care management, social work. And that is truly my passion because combining the two together, in my opinion, is the best route for patient advocacy, transitional care and great outcomes. I'm currently the senior vice president at Brookdale, and I've worked in mostly academic medical centers for most of my career and had a wonderful learning experience in every place I've been. Um, But none has really paralleled what I have experienced in Brooklyn in COVID. Um, I started my role here in February 2020, and I was here exactly three and a half weeks when we saw our first COVID patient strike. So, um, you know, as most of you know, when you start a new position, you really want to sit back and learn the organization for a few months and figure out what's going on. And so I did not really have that opportunity, but boy, did I get to learn this organization and get to learn a lot about managing COVID, creating a toolkit, doing best in class um, practices, which I hope to share with you today. That's great, Julie. Thank you. And Um, I'm going to dive in. I know that you shared some of some of those lessons that you learned early on. uh, It may be the end of March, beginning of April, as you were acclimating to your new role, but also seeing really on the the front lines of seeing so many um, COVID patients. So I'm going to first start with the question, um, you know, as as you were walking into the organization, you may have had that objective view. Can you name some of the things that you weren't prepared for? You know, that these COVID patients were walking in the door. Talk about what was top of mind for you. What was top of mind for me was just the unreal experience of starting with the first COVID patient And probably within hours, we went to 12. And then within days, we were at 60. Um, And we went from zero to 60 in days. Um, I don't think any organization in New York was prepared for the onslaught of the number of patients that were coming in with COVID and the the level of acuity that they were presenting with. So there were numerous patients that would come in walking and talking and saying, I'm having a little shortness of breath. I'm a little worried about this thing called COVID. And in 20 minutes, they were respiratory arresting and done. Um, And I don't think anyone was ever prepared for that. The other thing that I was not prepared for was the amount of death um, and destruction that we experienced here in Brooklyn. We were one of the epicenters for COVID in New York area. Um, I remember being on the phone with the New York State Department of Health and they said, we're going to bring in the tractor trailer, you know, refrigerators for your dead bodies. And we'll probably need three for Brookdale. And I thought, are they crazy? I don't need tractor trailers for 
expired patients. That's crazy. And sure enough, um, not only did we need them, we actually had to add shelving to them to fill them. Um, and I see that is happening now across the country. And that did happen here. Um, it was just something that I don't think anyone ever in their entire lives would have thought they would have experienced in healthcare in the United States in 2020. So I, I'm going to take that and leap into the early lessons that you learned and shared with ACMA members, uh, uh, case management professionals, in early April. We're going to talk about what's happening now, but uh, you and I have talked offline, and I'd like to share that with our listeners because the reaction in early April was... Um, there was some disbelief, I guess. So why don't you share with our listeners what you had talked to me about? Yeah, so really several months ago, I was asked to participate in a webcast for ACMA talking about COVID. And at that time, it was really a New York, New Jersey, Eastern Coast kind of situation. And I remember talking to the audience saying that you have to prepare and giving them ideas and toolkits and, and suggestions and very many people started chatting. It was one of those interactive sessions where people can you know, ask their questions. And there was an abundance of people from ACMA uh, members that were sending me emails saying, my CEO doesn't believe this is gonna happen in Texas, Arizona, Nevada. They think this is a New York thing or an East Coast thing, and it's never gonna make its way across the country. So we're not preparing at all. And I really shuddered to think that that could actually be true. Um, I really wanted to tell them to tell their CEOs to get their heads out of the sand, uh, so to speak, um, and really pay attention to what's happening. New York watched Europe very carefully because we knew that what was going on in Europe, in Europe was going to somehow transcend itself across the Atlantic and end up on the East Coast, and it did. And we continue to watch Europe now as they're going through their second surge and we're planning for what's beginning of our second surge. What I am seeing across the country is so painful because it's exactly what we experienced in New York in March and April. April 6th was our pinnacle day where we had 485 patients in this hospital and about 250 of them have COVID. Um, and so, I will never forget that it was it was Easter weekend, Passover weekend. That Friday, Saturday, Sunday was the absolute pinnacle of our COVID experience, and I am seeing that same type of experience with my colleagues across the country now, and it's it's very painful to see. Yeah, staggering numbers then, and staggering numbers now. Um, when you think about the things that you had to do in these early weeks, and we have in this season for this season one of this podcast, talk to different folks on what they've seen, what they've learned across their systems. Um, and innovation has occurred at, mm. you know, because it had to, right? So can you talk about any um, innovative work processes? You know, you're talking about preparation for that second surge. So what innovation occurred that either you hardwired or you're going to bring forward to help deal with what's happening today? Yeah, so there was a tremendous amount of innovation. It was almost like working in a war zone. So you make do with what you have and you become very creative in, you know, getting things that you need to survive. So we were very fortunate um, because we managed our PPE very effectively and kept really strong control over the PPE. Um, but people were still very innovative <laughs> when using PPE, I will tell you. Um, we saw some of my colleagues in other hospitals use black garbage bags as gowns because they didn't have enough gowns. We did not have that experience. But I think from a care management perspective, one of the more innovative things that we had done is there was this tremendous lack of access for patients and families to speak to each other, to see each other, to bond. And so it was frightening on both sides. Um, the patients were isolated. They couldn't see their family members. The families were fearful because they couldn't communicate, not even with the patients, but even with the staff because the staff were so overwhelmed. And we were able to secure a grant from Apple and they sent us hundreds of iPads. And we actually used the iPads 
to give to the patients, to communicate with their families so they could have FaceTime with their families. And that did a world of good for both the patient's um, well-being emotionally and the family's well-being, and also the staff who felt this horrible burden of being with patients that were severely ill and wanted to be with them at the end of their life, they were able to at times FaceTime with the family. So the families also felt that they could be part of this process. And that I thought was innovative at the time and something that we will continue to use um, for patients that have difficulty communicating with their families. So another theme that I've heard come up as as we're talking to folks is just um, that communication, not just uh, with with families and with patients, but also within your own health system. Mm -hmm. So you're in the hospital, but your your partners that are in the community, that post-acute network um, that is so critical for patients who are, still have a ways to go to recovery. So anything with the skilled nursing facilities or the long-term care, any comments about um, how you navigated strengthening um, that network? Yeah, I think at the time of COVID, it was completely shut off to us. So in New York, um, in the beginning, we didn't realize what was happening. So we were transferring patients into nursing, skilled nursing facilities when they were stable enough business as usual until the skilled nursing facilities became overwrought with COVID. And then it stopped. Um, the gates just closed and we could not transfer a single solitary patient back to a skilled nursing facility, which was an interesting dynamic because when you think of so much of what we talk about is length of stay and efficiency of care, we had hundreds of patients that were stuck in the hospital because there was no place to send them because the skilled nursing post-acute care facilities were locked down. I will tell you every crisis is an opportunity and I live my life by that and I do believe that. And we are starting to have discussions now that we're on the other side of COVID, thankfully, that we can start to have surge plans and, and progressive, innovative ideas. I have met with several of our post-acute partners to see if they would manage high flow patients on a uh, high flow oxygen, you know, patients, if they have a vent unit and they have the respiratory staff to support it, is this another modality that we're finding more effective than intubating patients is this high flow oxygen, but many of these patients are on that for months. Would they consider having high flow oxygen units? And many of the nursing facilities are saying, yes, we'll consider anything to be a partner with you. Their length of stay, their bed capacity is really wide open. They have lost a tremendous amount of business. They haven't been able to recover. So they're looking to partner with the hospitals. So I think it's important for the hospitals to think about what is it that your long stay patients need that can be managed in a post-acute facility and start talking to your partners about joint programs where you can move patients um, from a transitional perspective safely into a post-acute partner. And so that's, I think, been a great opportunity. That's excellent. Um, we're talking about workload, and so let's move back to some of the things that you saw um, as you were trying to have enough staff and um, deploy them appropriately. So for our case management professionals, the nurses, the social workers, the physicians, they've so many of them are in the throes of this now or have some of the lessons that you've taught. So in your organization, what did you do to uh, maximize the use of your staff? So there were a couple of things. The first thing we did is because of the onslaught and the number of patients we had, we really needed all hands on deck. And so we looked at every department, including case management, social work, utilization management, revenue cycle. We looked at every department to see what work is essential to continue. And if it is, can it be done remotely or not? And then we looked at the people that had to be remote. We let them you know, work remotely. From a care management perspective, and I know this is true for many hospitals in New York, the RNs were looked at as RNs. We need RNs on these units. You know, Forget about being a case manager. We need you to work as a nurse. 
Um, and so that was an interesting thing. And I say that on purpose because one of the lessons learned is the lack of understanding about people's roles in an organization. So when we would send nurses from care management or psychiatry or mother baby to the ER or a critical care unit to assist with day-to-day -day operations, the perception of the receiving unit is, well, you're not really a nurse because you don't know how to do blah, blah, blah. And so what we learned very quickly is three major things. One is we have to understand the capabilities of each member of the staff. So I may have had staff in case management that just left the ICU and just transferred to case management. So they have ICU skills. Or I may have staff in case management that have been there for 20 years and couldn't do a finger stick if they needed to. Um, and so there are different skill levels needed to be assessed and we needed to do on the spot quick education so that they would feel comfortable. The other thing is we needed to educate the receiving units because they were stressed with the amount of patients they had and the fear of the COVID and what they were dealing with. And when help came to them, they expected them to function as if they were an ICU nurse and they're not. So to really, um, one of the big lessons that were learned here is to clearly identify the role and the responsibilities of staff that you are uprooting from their home units and sending to units that need them and really educate the receiving units on what the roles of those staff members should be. Um, many of the care management staff here did work remotely for some period of time, and then we realized they were much better served in the hospital. So we tried to match them with appropriate skill sets to work on different units and or employee health to call mem you know, family members or staff just to follow up on their status in COVID. So we tried to maximize the skill sets of the staff with the places that we needed to um, deploy them to. Okay, that sounds good. So I want to make sure I didn't miss your your lesson. So one was to understand the uh, skills and capabilities, right, of yes. uh, the folks. And second was the need to educate. And I guess maybe your two and three was to educate the receiving unit as well as the person going with their expectations. Yes. Anything else on that? I think the biggest thing that I learned here is leadership, um, that we also in COVID had many, many, many of our staff were out sick as well as our leaders. And so we did have an absence of leadership and the absence of leadership definitely contributed to the increased fear of the staff. There was nobody really, you know, coddling the case management staff or staff from other units to make sure that they were okay enough. You know, people were checking in, but not checking in enough. So I would say the leaders have to be visible, this supportive, check in with the staff, make sure they're okay, identify what they're being asked to do, make sure it's appropriate. The leadership in a crisis is critical. And for me personally here, as a new person, I didn't really know my leaders and their capabilities, but at least 50% of them were out with COVID. So I had half of my leadership staff available. Um, and so we just all did the best we could getting out to the different units and making sure that we can offer as much support as possible. But to people out there that have leaders available, I can't stress enough how important it is to be supportive, visible, and communicate, communicate, communicate with the staff and let them know what's going on. Were there any specific communication vehicles? And I ask this because that's come up again in, in some of the interviews that having to be creative, I think, you know, what I'm listening to is is such a significant percentage of your staff was out. And, um, you know, were you using uh, emails? Were you communicating through leads on the units? Like, what were your strategies to make sure that, folks were getting the messages, uh, particularly, I would say, your case management staff who had right. to keep up with the regulatory pieces, what waivers were uh, granted, that kind of thing. Yeah. So to be honest with you, for at least in New York, when this was all going on, it was all bets were off with all of the regulatory requirements. And it was very interesting because in the beginning, when we were able to send patients home before, you know, three days in, a, in the hospital or, you know, the observation, the two minutes, I mean, all bets were off. We just did what we had to do when we had to do it 
to where we had to do it. And we really ignored um, what the regulatory requirements were. And they were lifted, you know, 100 percent. Even documentation was lifted. So but it all came very late. You know, the communications from New York State um, were very late in the game. So, for example, there was a communication on somewhere in mid-April. So we had already gone through probably six weeks of intense COVID uh, that said, don't worry about documentation. You won't be held accountable by Joint Commission if you don't do all of your documentation and your assessments. And people were like, what? Why didn't we hear that three weeks ago? Well, nobody heard it three weeks ago. You know, the communication was very irregular. Um, the rules were changing constantly. Even the methodology of treating patients was changing. First, we were intubating, then we were proning, then it was high flow oxygen, then it was rindesivir, then it was not this, you know, and the rules kept changing. And the staff were really looking to leadership for support. And it was very hard for them to trust when the story kept changing and the story changed because nobody knew what was happening. The knowledge, the level of knowledge on managing COVID early on in America was really in New York. And so we were learning as we went and we were trying to learn from what happened in Europe. Now I will say that I think thankfully, I think the rest of the country has a lot of medical lessons learned from the experience that happened on the East Coast. And we are treating patients better and they are surviving at a much higher rate but we were the first group. Um, and so every day the CDC would say, wear this. Oh, no, don't wear that. Change that. No, don't change that. And so we never really understood what the right thing to do was. We were learning as we went. Um, for me, I think the most distressing thing and with care management, you know, with a major focus on that is the lack of continuity, you know, throughout the country as to what we're supposed to be doing. It was every state was really on their own to figure out the rules. And that's still happening across the country where some are mandated to wear masks and some are not. And I think if there's one lesson learned, it's we have to have a national agenda to fight this across the board so that if there's equipment needed in one place and another place has another state has it, they should send it over there. They should be mandated to. Um, in New York early on, we were the only ones with COVID. We ran out of ventilators and there were states two hours away that had no COVID and yet we were deciding with patients who would live and who would die. And so I think that you know, when we talk about care management and, and end of life care and supporting patients and being the ultimate advocate, I think it was such a horrific time for us because you could not advocate for patients. It was very, very hard to advocate because of the volume and the lack of clarity as to what was acceptable practice in this crisis and what was not. And so we did the best to give as much knowledge that we had for the day to the staff. We did it via email. We had something called Brookdale News, which is a newsletter that went out. What I think a lesson learned retrospectively is an in-person huddle or a phone huddle is much more effective because people are not reading their emails. People are too busy to read their emails. So to say, let's get on a call for five minutes and talk about what's going on so I can reset the day and everybody can understand what we need to accomplish would be to me one of the biggest lessons learned. So uh, taking that forward, so there was a point at which... Um, you know, this hasn't gone away, but you had some stability after that initial crisis. And now um, you mentioned earlier, you're ramping up for the surge. We're seeing escalating numbers. So, you know, I guess two quest questions, you know, obviously, I think everyone it has taken those medical lessons and you're more prepared um, what does it look like today? And then when you look into the future, like what do you think is this lasting impact? What are we going to take forward? Today um, in New York, I'll speak for New York, you know, there is definitely COVID fatigue um, and we're starting to see that. Um, our numbers are low. Our numbers are under 3%. Our kids are in school full time. My daughter is a teacher in Brooklyn. She goes to school every day and teaches her class in person. Um, and the bars are open, the, the restaurants are open. And I've noticed slowly but surely people are starting to migrate back to the way things used to be, which I believe is way too early to do. Um, and when we know it's too early to do. So 
This past Saturday night, I was in a restaurant. I will only eat outdoors. I went inside to use the ladies' room. It was packed. And I thought, how can this be? How can people not believe that they still have to be careful? Because you get this false sense of security um, when you haven't seen what you've seen for so long. And we've been in New York, we've been cooped up since, you know, March. So it's been a very long time. I think that this is never going to go away. I think to a certain extent, it's going to be with us and we have to have a new normal. We have to have a new normal about um, washing hands. You know, I still can't believe that we can do hand washing surveys in hospitals. That always used to be before COVID. My biggest challenge was how do you get staff to wash their hands? And of course, during COVID, you know, that was not an issue. Now we're starting to do hand washing surveys again. And believe it or not, we have units that are not 100% compliant. How can that possibly be? So, um, you know, it's, it's people are starting to slowly retract back to the way things were. And they're getting this false sense of, okay, we're done. But it's not done. And we know it's not done because we've seen patients that have had a resurgence of COVID with a different strain. So patients have had COVID twice with two different strains. So just because you've had it doesn't mean you're immune to it. And we don't have enough knowledge to even understand it. So I think we always have to keep our guard up. We have to wear the masks home. Um, you take them off. But when you leave your house, I walk the dog, I wear a mask. You know, I go to a restaurant, I wear a mask. I don't think that we're going to be able to stop doing that for a very long time. I also think that we're very much more aware of our environments. I see people that I'm in contact with that are non-healthcare professionals that are very in tune to spacing, you know, personal space and hand washing and mask wearing. And, you know, I think that this is the new normal for us for quite some time. Um, I also think that people are still living with fear. Um, there's a tremendous amount of fear. I know from my staff, what I've done um, with each of my clinical services is I've done a SWOT analysis of strengths, weaknesses, opportunity, threat. And I've asked the staff, the frontline staff, what did we do really well? What were the weaknesses that we really need to learn from? What are the new opportunities? And what are the threats? And I actually did one today with my med surge team. And they said, our biggest threat is fear. We're afraid. We're afraid to come to work. We're afraid we're going to get COVID. We're afraid we're going to bring COVID home. We're afraid. And um, one of the things that my organization offered was an early retirement package for people if they were interested end of year through the uh, union that we have here. And 62 people took the package. And that's a very significant number. And several of them were in case management and social work. And when I asked them, why are you taking the package? They said, I think I'm done. You know, I don't know if I've got the resilience to go through this again. When I went to nursing school or social work school, I didn't think I was going to risk my life every day when I came to work. And now I feel like I'm potentially risking my life. So if I am close to the retirement age and you're offering me a way out, I'm taking it. Um, and I think we're going to see that across the country. I think we're already seeing people that are hovering on whether they're ready to change careers or retire. They're making the change because they're saying, if not now, then when? You know, I don't want to go through this again. I can't go through this again. And I think that's going to have very long lasting effects for us in healthcare. So um, I want to pursue that a little bit, a little bit further you know, we're always going to have a need to deliver health care, right? And we uh, work to inspire young people to uh, that this, this is a good profession. And then we also, um, you know, try to look to the future leadership. You talked about this previously that we have to develop. So on both of those planes, you know, in terms of inspiring people to come forward and join this workforce or to inspire those people in the workforce to maybe higher levels of leadership. Any thoughts? I, I know this is going to be the challenge for those in leadership right now. I am very inspired in spite of all the horrible things that I've talked about with COVID and the experiences that we've had I am incredibly inspired by the professionals and the humanity out there. Um, I will tell you that 
as I'm a new leader and as most leaders do, I'm filling my leadership team and I'm putting together a best in class group of people. Um, I'm amazed by the amount of people that are migrating and gravitating towards this organization, towards Brooklyn, knowing what we went through because they want to be part of the change. They want to be part of the solution. They want to be part of improving healthcare delivered to our communities here in Brooklyn. Um, it's not scaring them away. It's drawing them to and that's incredibly inspiring to me. It's why I came to this organization because I love working with underserved populations and I am in an underserved area. This is a safety net hospital, so we don't have the financial resources of many hospitals, but boy, do we have the engagement of the teams and the staff here. You know, they're, they're so engaged and so dedicated to this organization because they live in the community, this is their community, and they want us to thrive and survive. And I've had leadership from many of my past life, you know, reach out to me to say, I want to come to Brookdale. I want to work with your Brookdale. I want to meet your vision of really transforming healthcare to underserved people in Brooklyn. And instead of running away from it, which would be so easy to do, um, people are migrating towards it. I'm also seeing our own staff really step up. We had staff that were off, that came in on their days off, that stayed 24 hours because they didn't want to leave their colleagues. There was so much teamwork. Um, I think one of the biggest strengths that I saw among everything in COVID was the commitment of the staff to provide exceptional care to the patients. They wanted to be here. They didn't run away. And so I think that's very, very inspiring. Um, I think the other thing that has happened is it's important, another lesson, is to have a Zen room or a way for staff to decompress and de-stress. Many hospitals have built little rooms where staff can go and have you know, infused water, time out to rest. I saw one hospital actually created a true Zen room with a salt wall that staff can go and relax. Um, we had, we have a large psychiatry department. So one of the things we did every week, we had mindfulness, empathetic, um, you know, webinars for the staff. Anyone could join it. It was a Zoom. And you could talk about your feelings in a very trustful, you know, health healing way. Um, and so I think supporting staff's emotional recovery of COVID is going to be critical for any organization's success. And we're looking now on how we can continue that so that our staff always feel that they have someone to talk to when they're stressed out and they're feeling what they're feeling based on what they've experienced and somewhere that they can go to build this resiliency. So just one of my last questions, I know we're um, getting close on time. Um, and want to talk to Dr. Grant as well. But I just to circle back to the case management department, I mean, care coordination on our best day, pre-COVID, post-COVID is so critical, right? Right. To our patients, our families, and, and to the uh, efficiency and cost effectiveness of the care we give. So is there any change to the structure that you're going to make um, in terms of, you know, some were remote, some were um, uh, on site. Is there anything that you're going to do differently going forward? Maybe not today in anticipation of another surge, but going forward. Yes. Yeah, so um, everyone is now back. Um, there is no more remote workers. And I think that's critical for two reasons. One is our patients need us and our patients need the face-to-face. -face. And in covid that was incredibly difficult. Um, you know, I know that I've spoken to many care managers and social workers and other organizations as well as here, and they would be told things like, oh, well, you're a social worker, so you don't need PPE. Well, yes, I do. I go into the rooms and I talk to patients. You know, people have this false understanding of the roles. So, you know, first of all, I'm really working hard to, everyone is back. And I think it's important not only because they need to be with the patients, but they need to be with each other. It's very hard to support each other when you're zooming in from everyone's living rooms and dens. Um, it, you know, you're really isolated and it's very hard to do the work that we do I feel personally um, that care management and social work is a high touch department. It's not as high tech. 
We use technology to support us, but it's high touch. And so to work remotely is not high touch. Um, one of the things that I've thought a lot about is we have a brilliant team of social workers here. And we had so many opportunities that we could have leveraged them for psychological, psychosocial support to the staff, to the patients. And we didn't do that. We didn't do that. We said, social worker, okay, you could do clerical work, you know, when really they could have done social work work. Um, it was so needed. But I don't think at the time people really thought about what were the true needs of the organization. And if I had to do it over again, I would take the social workers who are skilled in empathy and, and support and really maybe even have them run groups of staff that just need to talk about the experience and grieve and, and do code lavender kind of training um, as second victims because we had a lot of second victims in this epidemic. You know, the patients were the first victim, the staff were the second. So I think there's a huge opportunity to leverage our teams. Um, care managers of course, the transition of care and advocating, you know, end of life was so confusing. You know, who's a DNR? Who's not? Let's code them. Let's not. Let's start the code. Oh, it's hopeless. You know, all of those end of life things that we are so involved with became very muddy uh, during COVID because people were coding two and three at a time. And so, again, to leverage, take the expertise of these experts in end of life and empathetic care and in social support and utilize them in the best possible way to improve the organization. Nobody was thinking like that. We were thinking warm bodies, where can we fit them? Um, and so if I had to do it all over again, and God willing, I won't have to, but just in case as part of our search plan, that is where I foresee a care management staff being most effective. I don't need a nurse to go and do vital signs on a floor. I need a nurse to go and talk about end of life with the physicians and make sure that we're advocating for the patients and doing the right thing for them. Um, so, and the end, uh, other thing I just want to mention is the discharge. You know, the safe discharge has a new meeting because what we would find in the heart of COVID is patients that were stable enough to go home the families didn't want to take them home. They were afraid to let them in their house. So what did a safe discharge mean? So to have a care manager or a social worker be able to navigate that and help the families to accept these patients from the hospital that could have been discharged, that as a result of not leveraging their expertise ended up staying in the hospital because we couldn't discharge them. I think that is a huge lesson learned for those of you that um, are in the midst of this. Um, use the case management and social work staff with the skill sets they have, and it will really improve not only patient flow, patient outcomes, but I think it will also improve staff outcomes. Well, that's excellent. And as you said, at New York and these lessons have really help lead the way for all of us in health care. So thank you for that. Um, Dr. Merkin, we have appreciated you sharing your expertise and your experience. And uh, I know that you'll um, welcome any questions that follow this. You've done that before. And uh, thank you for being with us today. It's my pleasure, and I hope everybody stays safe out there. Thank you very much for inviting me. Next, we welcome Dr. Robert Grant to the podcast today. Uh, Dr. Grant is the Plastic Surgeon-in-Chief at New York Presbyterian Hospital, the University Hospital of Columbia, and Weill Cornell. He's also the Professor of Surgery at Columbia University and at Weill Cornell Medical College. Uh, we know Dr. Grant. He is a friend of this podcast and of the American Case Management Association as he is the founding president of our Association of Physician Leaders in Care Management. And uh, really, ha we have valued his expertise and experience along the way. So welcome. And I'm going to invite you to share a little bit more about yourself as we begin today. Well, first of all, Deb, it's uh, an honor. I'm thrilled to be able to participate in the podcast. The partnership between the physician advisors who are part of the physician arm of the ACMA, the Association of Physician Leaders in Care Management, which we affectionately call APLCOM, and the larger umbrella organization, ACMA, is one that I think has benefited the care of, of patients 
not only before the pandemic, but of course, during the pandemic, and now as we're into the second wave. I'm often asked, how did a plastic surgeon get involved in care management and care transitions? And the, the reason why is our hospital system grew. And as someone who worked uh, in number of the different hospital campuses for many years, in addition to training, uh, the main criteria at that point was that I just knew a lot of the players and the territory. So it was an easy role for me to assume as I became interested in leadership roles within uh, our hospital organization. Um, yes, uh, a lot of what I do involves multidisciplinary care as well, uh, particularly in transplant and cancer and other service lines where specialists of many different uh, types and varieties are involved. So as a result, understanding how to manage both physicians in private practice, as well as physicians in an academic practice, uh, really added to my skill set in terms of abilities to uh, contribute. Having said that, uh, when the pandemic hit, it was all hands on deck. So it didn't matter what your specialty was. And um, they even had me, the chief of plastic surgery, at one point uh, relearning ventilator management and pulmonary critical care as so many patients early on in the spring became ill and required respiratory support. Fortunately, and I know we're gonna get into it in a little bit, I didn't need to be the person running the ventilator settings for our intubated patients. But uh, I look forward to the opportunity to share my experience uh, to talk about the lessons that we learned. And as we get into the second wave, really share experiences so that we can benefit everyone who's experiencing what we experienced in the spring in New York uh, in their home communities today. That's great. And thank you uh, for um, teeing that up because I think as we're interviewing folks about COVID um, at, from different health systems, I, I think the first question is, uh, what weren't you prepared for? And as you said, that's a familiar theme, all hands on deck. And you know, what skills, what capabilities do you have? Julie spoke about that earlier. So can you talk a little bit about what those early days were like and some of the the big challenges or the big surprises? The most uh, impressive aspect of it was the willingness of everyone to help, to pitch in. Uh, it was a time of great uh, pride in our community of caregivers uh, from the physician side, the nursing side, the support staff side, everybody wanted to help. So we weren't short of manpower and woman power. We were short of plans, logistics, PPE, ventilators, had multiple drills about disasters and disaster planning. Everything from terrorist attacks to a radioactive device inadvertently going off to Ebola. But no one really worked through all of what would happen when the tsunami of patients with an epidemic disease of the proportions that we experienced flooded all of the hospitals simultaneously. I think our planning uh, was something that was the biggest deficiency that we didn't have. And it's just a case of smart people not knowing what we didn't know. We've got great historians, great epidemiologists, great virologists, people who've lectured on what happened in 1918 and the Spanish flu, everything from how the wards were set up to how the nurses were organized to how the medical students also graduated early in 1980 and were thrown into the, into the breach. But what we didn't have was really an understanding of the supply chain issues and the disconnect between um, what needed to be done on the front lines and how we were gonna get those supplies and where we were getting from. You know, medicine transitioned to a just-in-time inventory system for a lot of good economic reasons. Uh, but the reality was we just hadn't stockpiled enough PPE and other necessary equipment so that we could apply it to a surge the way that we needed to. So that was a real, real important lesson, getting our suppliers down, not relying upon um, people who we didn't know and, and trust, who we didn't have relationships with uh, before. Uh, and there were some real um, 
sad stories of, of people being asked to care for patients without the supplies that they needed to provide the kind of care that we all wanted to and that we knew we could if we only had the resources at that time in that place to do so. So as you, you know, you talked about your role it was modified and adjusted um, and, you, and you're talking about relationships. Can you talk a little bit more about um, sort of innovative outreach that you had to, to do to get what you needed to, to move? I, I'm struck by the fact that not that many years ago, there was a significant hurricane, right, that came through New York and, and that is emer I'm confident there was emergency planning associated with those kinds of events. 9/11, um, obviously another one, but this this has been different. So, what did you learn about those community relationships, and what innovation did you see? We're blessed in New York that we have many people in the business community who are titans of their particular field. And we relied upon those people and those connections to cut through a lot of the noise about production and procurement of necessary supplies, you know, PPE, you know, ventilators. Um, we have a robust um, supply of ambulatory surgery centers um, that are involved, associated or not with the uh, medical center. And they were all willing and able to uh, contribute all their PPE, their ventilators, their um, gowns, masks uh, to, to help us. And um, a good part of my role in the early days was coordinating, since I knew who these people were, since I know the ambulatory world particularly well, given my own medical specialty, and working with our materials management people to vet the particular person uh, to, to give them the bona fides to say that this is a person who I can vouch for as worth spending uh, the time and interest, that, that this isn't the fly-by-night person who's just wanting to take advantage of a, of a dire situation. As unfortunately we saw, there were uh, lots of people who came out of the woodwork um, who, who either, it turned out, didn't have the connections they said or were trying to um, have equipment that wouldn't have met the standards uh, that we needed it to meet. Um, and, you know, there's a reason, you know, when you walk on the sidewalk in New York and you see the counterfeit, you know, handbags on, on Fifth Avenue, or I should say you used to before the pandemic, you know, selling for a tenth of the cost of what the Louis Vuitton handbag costs in the window, you know, and, and that was the same story that was happening in, um, you know, the, the procurement of PPE, that the cut rate people, which of course, you know, money was flying out the door, so they were getting everybody's attention, but the ability to really say that what they were selling was indeed what we needed was, was you know, very problematic. So relationships were particularly important to vouch for the integrity of the, um, all of these suppliers who, who were um, coming around to help us with our, our needs for those sorts of equipment. So out of all of that, you know, the title for today is like lessons from from New York, right? So out of that and sort of having that view of current state, and you talked at the beginning about the anticipation of another surge, you know, what are what are some core lessons um, about preparation? So the I think the biggest lessons to share aren't so much about uh, PPE and ventilators anymore because there's been enough time now for most hospital systems to identify domestic suppliers to stockpile a sufficient uh, PPE. Um, you know, New York State passed a law mandating you know 90 day supply worth of uh, PPE for e for each institution, uh, as an example. But what um, I think the, the the main lessons that I would like to talk about with you a little bit more have to do with understanding. Uh, when patients come into the hospital in an epidemic, when you can't have family, friends, and other people involved in their care the way that we do normally. One of the great ironies of the height of the pandemic was that the hospital was as quiet as I have ever seen it because there were no visitors. There was no one coming in or out. The patients came in through the emergency room no one was coming in the, the front door except at the change of shifts, the, the staff. Um, the lobby was empty. And, and 
really being sure that you have ways to communicate with patients, loved ones to update them, particularly since so many of the patients were intubated early on. And I know that ventilator management is a changing you know, topic nowadays. And, and we've learned that we don't need to intubate patients as often or as quickly as we did. But when you had patients in the pop-up ICUs that we had to build who were intubated, being cared for by rotating teams of nurses and doctors who the family or the patient didn't know, having a system to update the families on what the progress was and what the situation was, as well as to be able to brief the administrators on what the course was of each of those particular little silos so they could continue with their planning was is really an exercise that should be modeled by anyone who's looking at this particular problem uh, as it begins to come a little bit closer to home. So, so that's, that's issue number one is uh, particularly you know, as someone who was in charge of, um, you know, the hospital's utilization management and the chief physician advisor for our health system, I found that role particularly uh, important and, and helpful just in terms of being able to um, really make the families um, know that their patients were getting cared for. Some of the innovations involved, um, you know, getting uh, iPhones and iPads so that the patients uh, even when they were intubated, just so that the family members could see them. So we had a team of uh, radiology residents who, you know, they weren't doing mammograms and sonograms and other things, and they wanted to help. You know, like me, they didn't feel comfortable managing ventilators, but th what they did was they became part of these family liaison teams that we had to make sure that patients were kept up to date, typically on a daily basis after uh, the team made rounds, uh, we could participate remotely, and then we would take that information, distill it, and most of us became the primary source of information for the patient's families. You know, the, the doctors and nurses who were right there uh, in the trenches in the ICU would rotate, you know, every, you know, 12 to 24 hours, but every day our patient liaison teams, you know, would call sometime in the mid to late afternoon to give the family members an update or even more necessary if the patients, as many of them were early on, if their clinical situation was uh, was changing so dramatically. So that, that's lesson one. Lesson two um, is really to think about um, your post-discharge relationships. Uh, and that is a, a topic that involves everyone within the organization, um, the care managers, uh, care transition, but also the people in the C-suite because if you don't have a, a good relationship with a number of LTACs or post-acute facilities, you're going to find that you're, you're left with a number of chronic patients with, who are just filling up space that you need to do other things with. Uh, and the commitment for resources to care for these people is not a small task in any way. Most of them remain critically ill, as we know, with multiple uh, sequelae, whether they be neurologic or pulmonary or cardiac or, or uh, mental health. So having the opportunity to, to think in advance about a disaster plan that would, would mean that you need double or triple or quadruple um, the normal types of referrals for your post-acute and LTAC facilities and mental health facilities too, was not something that we needed to think about when we were, you know, dealing with the effects of Hurricane Sandy or 9-11 or, or whatever. So that, that's really um, lesson number two and, and one that I spent a lot of time with, particularly since, um, as I said, the, the families didn't really know where these facilities are and we had to get people out. So it meant oftentimes, even though you know the tri-state area is a small geographic area, um, if you're a bird, if you're a person in a car trying to navigate the roads and highways, it can be many hours to go a few miles. And, and once the patient is discharged, if they're from Brooklyn and you want to discharge them to an LTAC in Westchester, that creates a whole set of other issues, you know, not only dealing with their insurance coverage and, and making sure that their uh, stay is going to be covered and those sorts of things. So um, th those are really the, the two biggest, from my care management perspective, uh, areas that I would, uh, would, would recommend that our listeners think about in their organizations to make sure that they have robust planning about 
communication with the families on a day-to-day -day, day -day basis, as well as thinking about the transition after the patient is stabilized and is no longer in need of the acute care that can only be provided in the tertiary care hospital. So we've, we've heard that as a, a barrier, the long-term care facilities, the LTACs and the skilled nursing facilities had some capacity issues as well. They weren't always able to take those patients or the patients had to consider going home and where was home? Was it the, the long-term care facility or was it, you know, home, home? What did, what did that mean? So, um, as you, as you look at the, uh, you know, potential for an upcoming surge and just more than that, I think the impact for the future, um, do you think anything has changed in your organization that will, uh, be able to take the lessons you just described and move it forward? At the same time as the um, acute care needs of the sick people happened, we had the socioeconomic issues dealing with school closings and, and child care issues being, um, it's very hard to ask a woman to uh, take care of her kids if they're um, now at home, if schools are closed, and then ask her to take care of a parent or an elderly person because there's no room, you know, at the SNP, but, you know, they want to be taken care of by a, a loved one. So we, we really expanded the network of support for um, child care and resources for our own large community of people who work for us, many of whom are women and many of whom still, despite the advances that women have made in the workforce, still have the primary responsibility for many of the uh, management of the family issues that uh, impact their ability to not only do their job at work, but also to, to care for the family. So really ensure a robust ability to care for children so that women uh, don't feel um, that they are being held down to strictly their primary obligation as it should be to their family, and that they're able to coordinate care for their, their relatives so that they are healthy enough to be cared for at home with a visiting nurse um, coming in uh, once or twice a day, that, that I think most people would feel preferable to them being sent to a, to a SNF or to a care facility that's 60 or 80 or 90 miles you know, away, where their relative wouldn't be able to be visited, would be a you know, stranger where you're dealing with sundowning and, and issues of comfort and mental health that are compounding their physical uh, illness. So, so that's that's one issue to, to talk uh, about that that I think we have done uh, very well with. Um, other areas that we we're still working on, and you know, New York, um, you know, we have had our issues with nursing homes, as you point out. You know, the nursing homes were not prepared either in terms of their ability to socially distance uh, their nursing home residents, uh, make sure that their staff and nurses had enough PPE. So, I think there's been um, improvements there as as well. But um, I don't think the second wave is going to go completely without um, some challenges in those same areas that we experienced the first time, if it gets to be that bad. Good. So I want to go back to um, something you referred to earlier, where you're thinking about the care management team, right? You talk about utilization management and your physician advisors. Um, you are the founding president, past president of, of AppleCom, as you said, the Association for Physician Leaders and Care Management. When you think about that role, and um, obviously, Julie talked about this earlier, we talked to other interviews, you know, we had uh, CMS granted a lot of waivers, a lot of things that existed before in term in the regulatory space looked different uh, of essence uh, as um, you were navigating the pandemic. So as things start to equalize, and that might not be right away, do you see any change in the way we look at um, the care management role for physicians. You know, the physician advisors, you know, obviously medical directors are still in their roles, but any thoughts uh, for those in our audience, those physician folks that are looking to the future? So that's a fantastic question, Deb, and, and thank you so much for teeing it up for me. 
Uh, I'm going to put in a huge plug for the physicians who are listening to become members of AppleCom. I, I can't reinforce enough the networking, the personal growth opportunities, the educational opportunities, uh, the shared experience of physician leaders, which is why we call it physician leaders in care management, why we didn't just stick and say medical directors or physician advisors, because we know that there are multiple overlapping titles and physicians who play uh, such an important role in this kind of a situation. The leadership aspect was particularly um, important during the crisis because we had the knowledge and expertise to handle um, the new paradigm of care in, in ways I think that someone who wasn't involved understanding the value that the different members of the care management team have to, to help things go better. Not everybody, not every physician leader has the same skill set, but just some examples of the things that you know our physician leaders got involved with, you know, the physician advisor uh, role in care management. A lot of it had to do with uh, telemedicine, you know, making sure that um, our telemedicine platforms were robust, that they were inclusive, not only for uh, the patients, obviously, but also for uh, the physicians in the community, uh, the physicians in the academic practice, uh, that we interacted with our chief uh, in, in uh, CMIOs, the medical information officers, to make sure that our platform was one that could be easily uh, fixed. And, and we went through two different modifications, eventually ending up with a Zoom platform that really facilitated uh, not only the telemedicine, but also a lot of the interactions uh, between the professionals themselves, because we couldn't have interdisciplinary rounds on the units anymore. And we still needed to have those kind of discussions taking place uh, as the patients were getting better and moving through the, uh, the care delivery system. There's also things that had to do with um, reimbursement and having to figure out, um, you know, what our managed care contracts uh, would be. Many followed the government suite, of course, with waivers. But you know those needed to be confirmed uh, as well, and our physician advisors have relationships with the uh, managed care companies, so we leverage those uh, to great benefit uh, as as well. Um, particularly in some of our pay for performance programs that we have, uh, our ACO, uh, other things that the you know physicians were just so important on is the metrics and things we were studying and analyzing that we were using to report our results and our data were thrown out the window uh, because they just weren't applicable anymore. There wasn't an opportunity that a physician leader didn't see that they could make a difference. Um, and having experience networking with other physician leaders, seeing what their experience is, it's why I'm on this podcast today to talk about some of the things that I did in my physician leadership role as a physician advisor that really helped make a difference in the operational and organizational aspects of, of care delivery. I mean, that's really what this is, is about, the fact that, um, yes, we had our heroes on the front lines, you know, breathing uh, through their N95 masks and their face shields, putting in central lines and changing ventilator settings, but we also had and needed to have a tremendous number of people with knowledges that weren't necessarily 100% clinical, but were clinical enough to be able to interpret, explain, expand upon what uh, the needs were to um, the other stakeholders in the organization. That's great. And just uh, a, a personal question, as you think about the leadership of others in your organization, your own leadership and navigating the response to, to something that we could not have prepared for, uh, any any personal lessons learned or anything that you're going to take forward to say, you know, I've changed when I think about this. I, I mentioned before how proud I was of our community of caregivers and how everyone stepped up and, and volunteered. What I, what I wonder moving forward is, as with many things in American life, when the challenge becomes more sustained and not acute, will that degree of selflessness continue? And I, I look at that at, my, at myself. I'm, I mean, I'm not a kid anymore. You know, I have my risk factors. You know, uh, would I be as willing to go into the breach again and again and again 
you know, if I was a critical care anesthesiologist with 30 years of experience and a wife and family and kids, you know, if I was the emergency room doctor, is it somebody else's turn to, to, to do that? Um, and that is, I think, a philosophical question that we are all kind of struggling with. You know, at what point have you given as much as you can give and it's somebody else's turn to pick up the slack? Or is there no one else to pick up the slack? So, you know, when we take that oath, this is what that oath really means. You know, with being a physician, it's great uh, privilege, uh, but also comes great responsibility. And I think uh, at this particular point in time, the responsibility that we are given um, as we take that oath and get the privilege of caring for our fellow human beings and are licensed and recognized by our specialty boards as being experts, well, now it's it's the time when we really got to live up to the ideals of the profession that we've all pledged our lives and our livelihoods to. Thanks for those comments. That perspective, I think, is important and it's real. And uh, as healthcare professionals uh, in all disciplines are navigating this, I, I think those sentiments echo and and uh, we'll be sort of thinking about those things as we as we go forward. Um, we're almost out of time. And I would just ask ask you, Dr. Grant, is there any Anything else in summary, when you think about the lessons, Julie, you know, talked uh, from her perspective, uh, you know, similar kinds of things. But um, as you think about our um, contingent group of uh, care management folks, physicians, as well as nurses and social workers, et cetera, anything else that you would want to uh, say to them as, as folks in other parts of the country are in um, some straits that you found yourself in in March and April? Well, first, I want to congratulate our listeners for taking the time to spend a part of their day with us because it shows that they are interested in learning some lessons and maybe making their experience uh, currently better as a result of it. Um, I'll pitch again ACMA uh, and the resources that it has currently online um, this is not the only podcast that uh, I know that you have been moderating throughout the crisis. So make use of those uh, resources that are available to ACMA and AppleCom members. I think that they're uh, really wonderful. I think even better will be the presentations that we have once the pandemic subsides and we're able to physically get together again for our national meeting and for our physician leadership meetings. And we'll have lots of opportunities as physicians do to have our morbidity and mortality conference, so to speak, to talk about uh, with the opportunity for more data and reflection, uh, what lessons really did work and, and what we can improve upon the way that we're, we're doing now. So I was delighted to be invited to speak. I really think that uh, take advantage of every opportunity you can as a listener for access to the full playbook that ACMA offers. Um, it's a fantastic organization that is committed to the care of uh, patients and their families and to the people who are involved in care management and care transitions. We go with the trusted source. Um, we know that these are challenges. We know that the challenges don't have easy solutions. We know that the challenges many times are local and specific to the community or the healthcare system that you're uh, operating in. Um, but the breadth and depth of ACMA is such that there's a knowledge base and a group of people there who pretty much cover every healthcare organization throughout uh, the United States, you know, who are more than willing to help and share their experience the way that we have today. Well, thank you for sharing your experience and your expertise, Dr. Grant. You are always an important part of uh, ACMA and AppleCom and uh, really for our listeners today. I think these are important lessons to take forward. Um, don't forget to subscribe to Care Transitions Today, this podcast, as we upload new episodes. And if you have a chance, give us a rating and let us know what you think. Let us know what we can do better. Um, thank you all for listening today. Again, Dr. Grant and Julie Merkin, thank you for joining us and have a good day.